Okay, welcome everyone to this next edition of VMAX. Uh, just a quick reminder of the ground rules. Uh, everyone's video and audio will be muted. Your video cannot be turned on at any time, neither by you nor by us. Uh, during the Q&A session in the final 30 minutes, we will give you the opportunity to unmute yourselves to be able to ask live questions, uh, but we won't unmute your mic without your consent. So with that, let me hand off to our moderator for today, Claudia Sam. Claudia, take it away. All right, thank you. So today we are going to have uh, Ricardo Caballero and Alp Shimshik's research on model of asset price spirals and demand in the COVID crisis. Uh, Alp is gonna be presenting. I just wanna say before we get started, this is the last of the regular season of VMAX and we will be starting in July, the junior VMAX series and I want to encourage everybody to come. This is how we're gonna support our next generation of macro. So please keep attending. And they'll also be having a conference later in the summer that um, early career people can still submit to. All right, so without further ado, I'll take it away. Uh, thank you, uh, Claudia. And let me start by thanking the organizers for putting together this wonderful seminar series. I really benefited from it and it's great to participate. Thanks for um, having us. So let me share my uh, screen. So today I'm going to present um, a joint work with Ricardo Caballero. He's also in the audience and he'll be taking uh, questions in the Q and A. And this paper um, is motivated by the ongoing uh, COVID uh, recession. In particular, we are interested in the financial market aspects um, of the recession. Even though uh, the COVID shock uh, started out as a real shock, meaning that it affects primarily real households and real firms and declines real economic activity. In and around March, we saw that this shock also almost caused a financial crisis. So uh, uh, distress indicators like the volatility index reach levels that we had last seen in the global financial crisis and there was a widespread and large decline in asset um, classes. For instance, the stock market, S&P 500, declined by more than 30% uh, in a matter of weeks, although it recovered um, some of that uh, recent months. And uh, for, or you know, if you look at the bond markets, interest rate spreads, even on safer uh, credit, investment grade credit actually tripled. And the other thing that we had seen around this time is, um, very large and aggressive intervention by central banks around the world in financial markets. So for instance, in the US, the Fed um, pledged close to 20% uh, of the US GDP in different types of asset market and credit market supporting facilities. And just around when these programs, uh, after, uh, shortly after they are announced, we saw that uh, actually distress indicators started, started to normalize, asset prices started to increase. For instance, the spreads came down. Um, so motivated uh, by uh, these facts, in this paper, we develop a model uh, in which a real shocks, a shock that starts on the non-financial real side of the economy can create this type of um, mess in financial markets. And we also use uh, the model to think about the uh, policy interventions. Um, and before I get to the paper, I'd like to start out by giving you a little bit of a big picture framework that uh, my co-author and I have developed actually before uh, this shock hit. And, and as you'll see, the paper is a natural application of the framework. And we think of this framework as uh, uh, addressing a dual absorption problem. So the first absorption problem concerns the goods market and that's basically the boxes at the top here. So the economy produces as a, as a certain, we have a certain productive capacity to produce goods and services but once you have that capacity, there's also a problem of how do you generate enough demand from households, uh, firms, governments to actually absorb that capacity and to ensure that you in fact produce your capacity. And a lot of the uh, uh, recent macro literature of Keynes in variety is in fact about this absorption problem. But there's a parallel absorption problem and that is concerns the risk markets because economic activity also always involves risks and these risks are embedded in, in financial assets because they're claims to uh, future economic activity. 
Uh, so uh, there's an issue of how do you generate enough demand um, from your investors in financial markets to absorb uh, uh, risks. And, and finance literature, especially the asset pricing branch, deals with this absorption problem. And the recent finance literature, especially starting after the great global financial crisis, actually emphasized quite a bit the importance of the heterogeneity in risk demand in, in financial markets. So uh, in particular, there appear to be investors that are that have the expertise or perhaps the tolerance to invest in risky assets. So you can think about banks, financial institutions, hedge funds, different types of mutual funds. They actually specialize in investing in risky assets and they might also have higher, greater risk appetite. On the other end of the spectrum, there are also many investors with uh, much lower expertise or appetite for risk. In fact, many individuals, some individuals don't even participate in risk markets, but even when they participate, they might not invest uh, in the type of risky assets that, that other investors invest. So there's a lot of heterogeneity and the recent literature emphasized this heterogeneity is actually important empirically as well to understand asset prices. And these issues uh, are typically analyzed separately, but the point of the frame, our framework is that to highlight that they're quite naturally connected because asset prices um, uh, affect demand in both markets, as I'm gonna explain in a minute. And because of that, they provide a bridge by which issues um, can travel from one market to another. In particular, a real shock, like a COVID shock that starts out on the real side of the economy can travel to the financial markets and create the kind of problem that, uh, that, that we've seen. So, uh, so to analyze these interactions, we, we build the framework. Basically our framework turns these uh, boxes into equations. So the first equation is um, what we call output asset price relation. And that concerns the uh, upper boxes that concerns the goods market. And so this equation says all else equal, higher asset valuations, higher asset prices will induce greater spending and in a demand determined model, greater output. In the model specifically, this comes through wealth effects. So for instance, when house prices are higher or stock prices are higher, investors' uh, households are wealthier, so they spend more and that induces more demand and more output. But we think of this equation as capturing a broader set of linkages between asset prices and spending and aggregate demand. For instance, in an earlier paper, we had investment as well. And quite naturally, even if you don't put any frictions, you get uh, through a Q theory type relation, investment is also increasing in aggregate demand, right? If you value companies more, then com people invest more in companies and investment is an important part of aggregate demand too. If you add financial frictions, actually this relation becomes even stronger. For instance, uh, if let's say um, spreads go up because of financial frictions and that, that the households as well as firms will struggle to borrow, their borrowing constraints will be tighter. And again, they will cut spending. So, so, so for a variety of reason, we think there are quite strong connections theoretically between asset price and spending. And I recent empirical literature actually uh, verifies that these linkages can be, can be strong. They might not be immediate, they might operate with some delay, but eventually when asset prices are high or low, that will, will be reflected in spending. Now, the second equation is, is, is basically an asset price uh, equation that describes the, the asset price that clears the risk market given the risks in the economy, risk tolerances of different agents, the beliefs of different agents, as well as the, importantly also the policy interest rate. And that's how in fact the uh, central banks will influence the economy in our model through the asset, through asset prices and through financial markets. And we call it uh, the risk balance condition because uh, as you'll see, it, 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 it concerns equilibrium in the bottom boxes. It sort of ensures that, ensures that uh, risk markets are in equilibrium. And the third equation, uh, is um, what, we, uh, what we call endo endogenous risk tolerance relation. This basically endogenizes the risk tolerance that goes into the risk balance condition. And the way we endogenize it is that we explicitly model the two types of the different heterogeneity of in risk tolerance that I mentioned. So there are gonna be, there's gonna be two groups of agents in the model. There's risk tolerant agents, we call them banks, but really we interpret them uh, much more broadly as the um, uh, agents uh, that are willing or, uh, and able to absorb risk. And, and, and they're also less risk tolerant agents and we call them households again, interpreted uh, uh, broadly. For instance, some institutions can also fall into risk intolerant like pension funds if they're regulated to take risk or certain regulated banks. You know. so, uh, so this is a very broad categorization that we have in mind. 
And in this framework, we think of the COVID shock as, as something that hits the upper boxes. And specifically, we're gonna make it a supply shock uh, in the goods market. So our productive capacity declines. And we think this is actually a reasonable way to think about the, the COVID shock. But for us, it would be relatively easy to add explicit exogenous demand shocks as well, because uh, the name of the game here and the main result is gonna be that uh, even if you model the COVID shock as a supply shock, um, it will uh, travel to risk markets. It will lower the demand for risk. And through this uh, impact on the demand for risk, it will actually lower asset prices and with it aggregate demand and, and, and might turn the original supply problem into a demand problem. You might have an ex excessive decline in economic activity that exceeds even the decline in our productive capacity. And you see, uh, given that that's the main result, adding exogenous demand components would just make things even stronger for us. And our second result is that in this type of environment, unconventional policies of the type that we have seen in and around uh, March and later um, actually uh, can be quite powerful because they can mitigate, the, they don't deal with the original supply problem, of course, but they, did, they mitigate and deal with the excess demand amplification uh, of the problem. And really um, the subtle part of the argument here is this diagonal red arrow here. How do you go from a problem in the goods market, a declining capacity to reduce demand for risk? And that's related to this heterogeneous uh, risk tolerances that I uh, described earlier. In particular, if you have uh, agents with different uh, risk tolerance, naturally, the more risk tolerance ones expose themselves more to economic and financial risk. So in our model, they uh, choose levered uh, portfolios uh, because they are more willing and able to take risk. And therefore, we in fact start them with levered portfolios. That's what they would do if they could choose as well. So in particular, um, uh, they invest in, in assets uh, more than allowed by their wealth and they finance these investments with debt and households conversely make safer investments. They invest less in risky assets compared to their wealth and they also invest in some uh, debt issued by the risk tolerant agents. And why does this matter? Because this means that when you get a recessionary shock like a COVID shock, that the, the initial impact of the shock will, will reduce asset prices, right? There's basically no way around it. Asset prices will decline somewhat. But once asset prices start declining, you see it will hit the banks a lot more than households, right? Because they're levered. So any given amount of decline in asset prices will generate now a much bigger proportion of decline in their wealth compared to the household's wealth. Now, why does that matter? Because it turns out if you do the asset pricing in this environment, you see the effective tolerance that determines the asset prices is basically what you might expect. It's a wealth-weighted average of the two tolerances. So when banks uh, get into distress and their wealth relative to the other guys decline, you basically see a decline in effective tolerance, right? Another way to think about that is that when banks get into distress, they need to shrink their balance sheets. They need to sell assets. And those assets now are held by households with lower risk tolerance and effectively reprice assets with less uh, tolerance. Uh, why does that matter? Well, because once the risk tolerance declines, this will put downward pressure on asset prices and with it, downward pressure on aggregate demand. Now, remember the supply declined and now we get a downward pressure on asset prices. So if this uh, downward pressure is big enough, you can actually have demand decline even more than the supply. So you can have an excess demand problem in your head. It doesn't always happen by, uh, uh, by the way, because remember the supply also declines. So it could be that the demand doesn't decline as much. But we think what is the, in the realistic scenario, it does decline more than the supply. And what is the conditions for what are the conditions for that? That happens when these uh, endogenous risk tolerance mechanism is strong. So when, when banks or risk tolerant agents have relatively high leverage to begin with, or when the shock is big, to, that will also make these effects stronger. Or when the shock is more persistent, somewhat persistent, as I'm going to explain, it makes these risk tolerance effects stronger. So in the, in, as long as uh, some of those conditions hold, you're going to get uh, actually demand decline more than the supply, and, and you're going to have an excess uh, demand uh, problem. So we think these conditions are, are, uh, are the relevant case to think about, especially if you think about the earlier stages of the, of the crisis. Now, um, how does the policy react to this? Well, the natural reaction is to cut interest rates, right? Because there's an excess demand problem and the Fed cuts the interest rate in our model it, it, it actually works through asset prices. So remember there was this downward pressure on asset prices and with sort of potential to generate a demand problem, the Fed cuts the interest rate 
diffuses the downward pressure that helps support aggregate demand and economic activity. And that's what the Fed and the ECB and all the major central banks did uh, when the shock hit, but they, they ran into a constraint, right? In the US, they run into the zero lower bound. And you, know, uh, you can also imagine other central banks running into other sorts of constraints. For instance, emerging market central banks, like uh, I'm from Turkey, the Turkish central bank is, is constrained to how much cut they can cut interest rates because they worry about uh, depreciation of the currency, which could create some other problem in the economy. So for a variety of reasons, as long as the central bank cannot cut interest rate enough to accommodate uh, the shock, then in fact, asset prices and aggregate demand start falling. And, and, and once that happens, now uh, everything that I say, I said become amplified, right? Because the problem was that initially asset prices declined due to the supply shock and that caused distress. Now asset prices are declining even more and uh, you're unable to, uh, to correct for that. And that will put even more distress on the banks that will lower the risk tolerance even more. And, and that will actually reduce asset prices even more. And you can get into a very ugly spiral that ends up with very low asset prices, low aggregate demand and economic activity. And an extension we show if you add corporate debt overhead problem, which is actually a, a, a big concern uh, with the COVID shock, but it was actually a concern even before the COVID shock, then all these uh, spirals, the spirals become even stronger. Why? Because asset price and economic activity declines. Uh, if their firms, corporations have some debt overhang problem, they have some liabilities that they need to meet. More of them become bankrupt and that will make the effects even bigger, the, 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 boom, the mess becomes even bigger, right? So, but, but the central bank, as we've seen, the central banks don't stay put when, the, when there's a shock like this, even when the regular policy or the interest rate becomes uh, constrained. So um, uh, they do unconventional monetary policy and we model unconventional policy uh, uh, as follows. So, so in our setup, we make the central bank invest in risky assets and, and finance by um, safe assets. Okay? So, so uh, what does that do? that directly gets to the root of the problem, right? Because the central bank takes risk away from the market. What was the problem? The problem is that the, uh, the shock hit the risk tolerant agents and the market is struggling to hold risk. Central bank says, wait a minute, why don't you give those risky assets to me for a while? And so you have to hold less risk. And when, when the market is less risk tolerant, if they have to deal with less risk, they can still do that, okay? So, so that ends up increasing asset prices. And once you start increasing asset prices, you actually trigger now a virtuous spiral. You make these spirals now work in your favor. So you can get a very high multiplier on these policies in our setup, um, precisely when these amplification effects are strong and the economy is most unstable. And in particular, we do an optimal policy exercise where um, we give the government its own risk preferences and so on. And, and we make the government actually less risk tolerant than even the least tolerant agent in the economy. So the micro instincts of the government is not to take risk. We think of this as capturing perhaps European monetary policymakers that don't seem to like to take risk. Nonetheless, in our in environment, they end up doing these interventions. Why? Because they do it for the macro benefits by, by improving asset prices and with aggregate demand, you are mitigating uh, the demand recession and improving economic activity. And, 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 and you might go against your natural instincts and do these asset purchases because of that. So, um, let me um, get to the model. So um, the model um, has a single uh, factor, um, capital. So um, it's, it's useful to have capital when you think about asset prices. That's why we focus on capital. And, and there is no investment or depreciation for simplicity. So basically one unit of capital. And the productivity of this capital is ZT. That's basically potential output. That's how much we could in principle produce. But actual output denoted by Y can be different because of it's a Keynesian uh, demand uh, driven model. Now, um, there are two periods. So uh, that's a little stylized, but in our earlier work, we actually have uh, uh, dynamics and continuous time. And none of uh, what I'm gonna say today uh, depends on the two period assumption. Two periods just makes things quite tractable. And um, in, for the future period, we think of it as a time when, when the economy, when you're out of the woods, at least in terms of the demand problem. So output is determined by productivity. Another important feature about the future is uh, that uh, demand, the, uh, the productivity and therefore output in the future is risky, right? So, so we have aggregate risk, 
and that captures the usual risk of economic activity. Sigma here is the volatility, Z bar is the mean. But you could also imagine maybe the sigma is elevated at times like the COVID shock, although that's not what we're going to emphasize. Fo we're going to focus on um, period zero. Um, so uh, in period zero, output Y zero is not necessarily going to be uh, Z zero. Output is going to be determined by demand. So in the background, there are uh, new Keynesian firms with, for simplicity, fully sticky prices. And they're going to be happy to beat the demand as long as the price is above their marginal cost, which will be the case in the equilibrium. Um, so that makes the demand the forcing variable. And in financial markets, there are uh, two assets. There is a market portfolio that's basically claim to all economic activity in this model. You can think about a claim on capital. So, uh, and, and Z times Q, so is its price at the end of the period. That's the part that's a claim to future, but we also get the current um, uh, payoff. And, uh, and here we've normalized the asset price so that Q0 denotes the price per unit of supply that will up to uh, simplify the notation. But you should remember that Z times Q is the asset price here, not Q. And it's gonna have, this price will be endogenous and the return is also gonna be endogenous. And there's a second asset, there's a risk-free asset and that, that's gonna be in zero net supply and uh, with, with some return RF, that's gonna be set basically by the central bank. And um, there are uh, on the demand side, two agents. And uh, these are the banks and the households that I've been talking about. And, and they have relatively standard um, epstein zinn type preferences. So in particular, uh, in, uh, we make their elasticity of intertemporal substitution equal to one. So in terms of the consumption savings decision, they're really like log utility agents that helps to isolate the wealth effect, which is what we wanna emphasize here. Okay? But we allow them um, uh, to be, we, allow, we are more flexible in the risk uh, aversion margin. So we allow these agents to have uh, potentially different risk aversion or different risk tolerance. So tau here is the inverse of the risk aversion parameter. So that's the risk tolerance. And banks have greater risk tolerance than households. And accordingly, uh, banks also start with initially with uh, levered portfolios, like I've described earlier. And um, L0 here is the debt to asset uh, ratio of the banks. It's basically a measure of their leverage. Uh, when it's closer to one, they're more levered. And um, that's, it's normalized so that when the Z shock is, is at a normalized level, which is, you can think about the Z0 is what at the level that you expected before the COVID, that would be the leverage ratio of the banks. Okay, so that's the measure of their initial leverage. And the central banks here um, try to do the right thing. Central bank um, sets the interest rate to ensure that manages the demand and to ensure that to, uh, you operate at capacity. It's trying to set Y equals to Z, but it might be constrained. And we explicitly have the lower bound, zero lower bound constraint, but really any zero is not special here. Any lower bound constraint would, would work very similarly. And our star here, we define it to be the level of interest rate that, that, that replicates the supply determinant uh, up. So this basically is the, is the model. And um, I'm going to show you the solution to the model. I'm going to skip the intermediate um, derivations, but explain uh, the, the intuitions while, while I show the equations. And I'm gonna show you the, also the solution for a special case that leads to a little less clutter equations. But basically the first equation here is, is as I mentioned, is what we call output asset price relation. So with notation, it says output Y zero is basically proportional to the asset price here, which is Z times Q. And again, what's the intuition for this? It's the wealth effect, right? So because we have log utility type agents, all else equal, if asset prices are higher, they spend more. And then it works to a little Keynesian multiplier and it induces greater spending. And because it's a demand determined model, greater output. And, and like I said, we, this plus here, uh, we, we, we think this captures much broader set of linkages between asset prices and aggregate demand and output. The second equation is what we call um, the risk balance condition. And this comes from uh, the portfolio optimality decisions of the agents. And it literally says the following, this is why we call this balance. The supply of risk, which is exogenous in our model is equal to the demand for risk. And the demand for risk has two components. The first component is the effective risk tolerance. So more risk tolerance, more demand for risk. I'm gonna explain that in a minute. The second component is the reward for risk. So the bigger reward for risk, the more demand for risk. And what is this reward? 
So it's the expected return on the market portfolio, risky asset. And what is that? That's the expected payoff divided by the current price. It's basically the usual definition of return relative to the return on the safe asset. So that's the risk premium that you earn on average from investing in the risky asset normalized uh, by the risk. So that's a, a reward measure normalized by risk. And this is called the Sharpe ratio. And this is actually used quite uh, in financial markets uh, also to measure the attractiveness of investment opportunities, risk measure opportunities. Uh, so it shows up in our model. And the final uh, equation is what we call the risk tolerance asset price relation. And this basically says the risk tolerance that goes into the second equation is a, a weighted average of the risk tolerances of the agents in your economy. So an alpha here is the wealth share of the bank. So when their wealth share is bigger, you got closer to the bank risk tolerance, which is high. When their wealth share is smaller, you get closer to the household risk tolerance, which is low. And actually we have a closed form solution for this bank's wealth share. And if you look at that solution, you see um, it's increasing in the asset price and that's a key mechanism. Why? Well, actually you see it's not increasing. If they were not levered, if L0 was zero, it wouldn't be increasing, it was just constant. But whenever they're levered, L0 is bigger, you see it's an increasing function. It captures the sort of the picture I showed you earlier with when your banks are levered, a shock that uh, lowers their uh, wealth more than the other guys. So they, they lowers uh, their wealth share, right? So it shows up in the equations as well. And as, as naturally, this, this relation is gonna be stronger when you have more leverage or a worse shock, lower Z. And because of this relation, the risk tolerance itself becomes now an increasing function of the asset price. Again, the idea is higher asset prices, healthier risk tolerant agents or banks and bigger effective uh, uh, risk tolerance. Okay? So, so these are basically the model equations. And if you think about um, solving, so what are you trying to solve here? You're trying to solve for the asset price Q and output, why? and you, everything else is exogenous and RF is the policy value. Okay, so, and you see the model is nicely modular. So the first equation, once you solve the asset price from the bottom equations, you can solve for the output uh, from the first equation, right? So that's what we do. We focus on the last two equations here. In particular, if you combine them, you can get a single equation that looks like this. So this equation is just a risk balance condition, but I moved tau zero to the left so I left on the right side, just uh, the sharp ratio, the reward for risk. And on the left side, we have the risk divided by the risk tolerance. And we call that the required sharp ratio because this is the uh, sharp ratio that the, the markets effectively require in equilibrium to balance the risk market. So and as you see, lower tolerance means higher uh, required uh, reward, required sharp ratio. And so basically we're gonna use, think about this equation to think about, uh, use this equation to think about uh, solve for Q, which is now the only endogenous variable leaving aside the policy variable. And we're gonna think about how a shock uh, to Z, Z zero initial decline in productivity, which we think is one way of thinking about the COVID shock affects the uh, asset price and ultimately the outcomes. And let's think, first uh, think about a benchmark where there is no constraint on the policy rate. So in that benchmark, the central bank uh, always sets the rate appropriately to ensure output is equal to its potential. And, in, and with our normalization, it means that you make the asset price per supply per potential equal to one, okay? So, so Q star is one. So in, that, uh, so in that case, you can basically plug uh, Q star one into the equation and solve for the R star, right? And what is the policy rate that I need to set to ensure that asset prices are just high enough to induce just enough spending to clear the goods market at potential. So if you look at the formula for R star, you see, uh, a decline in Z0 affects this interest rate that central bank needs to set actually in two ways. The first is what we call, what you might think about as an expected recovery effect, right? So the decline in Z0 lowers asset valuations, right? I mean, asset prices decline goes through the supply effect of the shock. But um, if you think the shock is temporary and it's gonna go away, and we're gonna go back to basically the earlier, the pre-shock expected payoff, you see it increases the expected return on risky assets, right? Because uh, financial assets are forward looking. If asset, when asset prices fall now, if the future hasn't changed much, actually they become kind of attractive. And if the central bank didn't do anything about this, it would actually uh, increase uh, Q price per supply and it would create a, a potentially excess demand problem. So this effect by itself actually 
induces the central bank to raise the interest rate. Right? Of course, that's not what the effect I want to emphasize. There's also a second effect here, and that comes through this endogenous risk tolerance, right? And what's the intuition here? Lower uh, asset prices now um, put banks into distress, lower risk tolerance, and that puts now downward pressure on Q, even when you normalize by supply, it will tend to go down. So that will uh, force the central bank to kind of cut the rate to ensure that you don't get an excess too low demand problem and, and, and demand recession, right? So, so it's a tug of war between these two forces, but the second force dominates whenever the risk tolerance effects are strong, right? And when does that happen? When banks are, or risk tolerant agents are initially more lever, or when the shock is big, is the decline, is it that, that's, those are the situations when the second effect dominates. Also, uh, it dominates actually always, regardless of L and Z, if you're willing to assume that the shock is persistent. Right? Because if you're willing to assume the shock is persistent, you see there is no expected recovery effect. Right? If, you, if you make the assumption that productivity will fall and will remain low, now it will be uncertain around at a lower level. In that case, in fact, we don't expect the recovery of supply and this whole effect goes away and always you have really strong. Okay, so, so we make that assumption going forward, which we think is a reasonable way to think about this shock, especially if you think about the earlier stages, but perhaps even now, we hope it to be temporary, but we don't really know, right? But we don't need to make such a strong assumption. Basically, we need just this combination of these three things to be in a way that there is tolerance effect dominance, right? So when that happens, basically you have our star decline. So you have potential demand recession, even though the original trigger is a supply. So, so let's think about that case. Because in that case, in fact, now the Fed cuts the interest rate, but it might run into the zero lower one. So how does the equilibrium play out? So uh, going back to our equation, let me plug this persistent shock here. Um, now, uh, see, for now, Q is only unknown here, and it shows up on both sides of the equation. So, um, so we turn this into a picture, and that helps to understand the solution. Uh, how, what is the picture? Well, the picture plots both sides of this equation as a function of Q. Okay? So in particular, the red line here plots the required shock ratio, the left side of the equation, as a function of Q. And it says that higher Q, higher all else equal, higher asset prices, healthier banks or risk tolerant agents, and uh, high, greater risk tolerance and lower required sharp ratio. Right? The blue line it was plot now plus the right side of the equation, and that's the actual uh, sharp ratio, and that's also decreasing in Q. And what's the intuition here? All else equal, greater uh, asset prices mean lower returns, right? So if the stock prices or bond prices go up, the returns all else equal go down, a lower premium, so a lower reward, and that's why the blue line is decreasing. And the equilibrium uh, is in the intersection. And you see here, by the way, um, the, how the monetary policy works. It works through the right side of the equation. By changing the risk-free interest rate, monetary policy basically shifts the sharp ratio, shifts the blue curve, right? And what's the intuition that if you cut the safe rate, risk-free rate, all else equal, you're raising the risk premium, making risky assets more attractive and that raises uh, the sharp ratio, right? So you shift the, you can shift the blue curve. And initially here, we envision a situation where um, uh, Z is normalized, some sort of normalized level and uh, the policy rate is in fact positive. You're able to ensure that um, you Q is equal to one, which is means that you operate exactly at capacity with a positive interest rate, right? So, so the pre-COVID situation, just to repeat, is a situation where the interest rates are positive, you operate at capacity, Q uh, price per supply is exactly where it should be. Okay, that's the, how, we, how things start. Now, uh, let's think about a shock to Z0, supply shock that reduces productive capacity. What happens, you see, if once we make the persistent assumption, it only shifts the left side of the equation. So the required sharp ratio, and how does it shift? It raises it, right? So you get that required sharp ratio goes up, why? because low asset prices put, make, uh, puts uh, your risk tolerant agents banks into distress, lower the effective risk tolerance in the economy, and now you require bigger rewards to invest in the same assets, right? That's what the, the shift of the right curve captures. And, and this runs the danger of pushing asset prices into a very low and with aggregate demand into a low level. So the Fed reacts to it. The Fed reacts by cutting the rate, by raising the blue curve. Essentially, the Fed is trying to make the blue line sort of match the, the red line, right? So you cut the risk, uh, risk free rate, raise the reward for risk investing in these classes, trying to ensure that you don't get a big decline in asset price and demand, but you might run into a wall. 
So here uh, in this uh, numerical example, we run into the zero lower bound, but for a variety of reasons, you might not be fully able to cut the rates and shift the blue curve. And if that happens, in fact, you're gonna get a big decline in asset prices and big equilibrium increase in the risk premium and sharp ratio, right? So, and, and let me actually emphasize here that the, the sort of from a starting point of, um, uh, from the starting point, the final increase that you see in the risk, risk premium or the sharp ratio could be actually quite bigger uh, compared to the initial shift of, uh, of the required uh, uh, sharp ratio, the required risk premium, right? So, now, why is that? Well, that illustrates the amplification mechanism. Because you initially get sort of, okay, you require a higher uh, risk premium and higher sharp ratio, and the uh, monetary policy cannot accommodate that. So that uh, induces the prices to decline. And that helps to stabilize risk markets because when the prices decline, now risk assets become more attractive, return goes up. So you start to equilibrate the risk uh, prices a bit. But now, uh, because asset prices are lower, uh, your banks are in more trouble. So the required sharp ratio becomes even, uh, even bigger, right? So you're trying to get to the red line, but it's sort of running away from you. And then you're gonna have a bigger decline in asset price and bigger increase in the risk premium. So you're gonna end up in a situation where uh, risk premium will increase a lot, a lot more than the initial shift and, and the asset prices will decline a lot. And, and, and here you see um, the, a steeper red line means a much bigger amplification, potentially a very ugly spirals. And when is the red line steeper? What does it mean? It means when the risk tolerance is more endogenous to asset prices, that's when the red line is gonna be steeper. And so when does that happen? That happens when your banks are initially more levered or when the shock is big. So if it's Z0 or falls a lot. And in fact, you see the second effect already in this picture. So when you get a decline in Z, Z it doesn't just uh, shift the red curve, it also makes it steeper, right? And what's the intuition? That's actually following it as an intuition for it. For a levered entity, the initial losses are not gonna be such a big problem. They're not gonna put so much distress, but if they make, keep making losses, the endogenous will become lower, and now they become a lot more sensitive to further losses, right? So, so a, a big shot or a, a starting with initial leverage can create very ugly uh, spirals here. And in fact, if this red line is steep enough, you can get a situation with multiple equilibria. equilibria. So multiple, uh, equilibria that can be Pareto ranked. There, is, there can be a very bad equilibrium with low asset prices and high risk premium and a good equilibrium with high asset prices and low risk premium. And the H here is better for everyone because high asset prices, higher output and so on. Um, but uh, we're not gonna emphasize the case with multiplicity because we think this case with single equilibrium is already interesting and captures the relevant uh, economics here. So uh, let us me now introduce the LSAPs. Government doesn't put here, right? So government, as we have seen in practice, can react to this type of situation um, with unconventional policies. So we uh, model uh, the unconventional policies as follows. Right? I now introduce a, a third agent, it's called the government. And it starts with an initial balance sheet. And on the asset side, it has basically claims, with what we think is claims to future tax revenues. And this actually taxes fall into a future generation, right? Um, so you can imagine some of that, of course, also falls into current generation, but this is a, a, a way of breaking Ricardo and equivalence type, type effects. And we think it's actually sensible that some of the taxes are to future generation that don't participate in financial markets. So they won't be able to undo what you're doing here, okay? So that's the tax revenues. And we make these tax revenues uh, risky. So they actually uh, proportional to Z1 which is natural, um, so high good, good times, more tax revenue, bad times, less tax revenue. So you basically can think of the government as starting with an initial endowment of eta G units of the market portfolio. Okay? And this is uh, government's wealth, which it will use in the future to do spending or perhaps also transfers to the future generation, right? So, so this is the initial state of affairs. And uh, what does the government do with ELSA? Well, it comes in and expands its balance sheet. Basically it invests in market portfolio, it, here it, it buys fraction lambda of the market portfolio and it finances it by issuing safe asset. Okay, so it sort of issues to just to lambda ZQ, the, the value of the market portfolio units of the safe asset okay, here. And so it basically shifts out its balance, it sort of expands its balance sheet. By doing that, it makes its balance sheet risky, right? So uh, it could in fact be that the government earns, a, a, in fact, you're gonna earn a risk premium on the market portfolio. So you could end up making money off this, but you also 
there's a, a chance that things won't go so well, in which case we're going to make some loss. Right? The government, the important thing here is, is that the government absorbs uh, risk. And, and uh, consistent with that intuition, how does this intervention affect the risk uh, uh, balance equation? The intuitive way. So the left side becomes not sigma, but sigma times one minus lambda, because the fraction lambda of the risk is absorbed by the government. So now there is less that will, that's left to be absorbed by uh, the private markets. And so, so it also operates on the left side of the equation. Uh, remember the sharp uh, uh, raised the required sharp ratio, right? But now the government comes and takes the risk away from the market and that lowers the required sharp ratio because now there's less risk for the market to absorb. So they require less reward for it to absorb that as well. So the red line shifts down and just like the upward shifts can be very uh, uh, powerful and, and the, the downward direction, now the downward shift can also be very powerful in the upward direction, right? So, so that's why these policies can be quite powerful uh, because they basically make these spirals work, work for you, right? They undo the spirals. And, and you see, uh, in fact, they, they are pro more powerful when the red line is steeper, which is precisely when these amplification effects are strong, right? So again, when does that happen? When the shock is big, low Z, or when you are initially levered, uh, more levered entities, okay? So, and let me also emphasize uh, here that the government is um, uh, uh, doing this to support aggregate demand, right? So why, by, by improving asset prices, you improve in our model also aggregate demand. There is a one-to-one -one relation. That's perhaps extreme that there's a one-to-one -one relation, but the broader point is that by increasing asset prices, you support demand and you mitigate the demand recession aspect of the problem. Right? Now, uh, we uh, set up an optimal planning problem as well, just to think about the determinants of how much you wanna do LSAPs here. And the way we do that is we give the government its own risk tolerance uh, parameter. So it's, it's called its own preferences that are similar to the household preferences. And so in particular government has its own risk tolerance. And we also make this risk tolerance relatively low. In fact, lower than even household risk tolerance. So, so the, for micro reasons, in fact, there is no reason for the government to take risk. But, but, but nonetheless, because of these macro benefits of improving aggregate demand and stabilizing the economy, the government ends up taking risk. And if you look at the sort of the optimality condition for Lambda, so this condition tells you, when do you stop adding more risk to your balance sheet? You see, uh, you stop and the marginal cost of adding the risk relative to the market, which is the opportunity cost, is uh, equal to the benefit. And the benefit is exactly what you would expect. It's the benefit that you're getting at the margin from improving asset prices because that improves aggregate. Right, so, so if you use this equation, you can get a, a number of comparative statics. So, so most uh, obviously, if you make the government more risk tolerant, lambda is bigger, you go fur further. Uh, so the costs are lower, you go further uh, high in, in, into purchases. Uh, less uh, obviously, if you actually raise the government's fiscal capacity, eta G, remember that was the claims on future tax revenues, um, that actually makes the government also go further. Right, so, um, so a, a country like the developed country like the US with more um, tax capacity actually ends up in our setup doing more of these purchases relative to uh, maybe an emerging market like Turkey with more limited fiscal capacity. Now, why is that? Well, that's because let me go back to this balance sheet. If you're like the US, uh, your ETAG is big, you have big claim on future tax revenues, uh, sort of adding risk for you is relatively less distortionary, right? You can, you can add risky assets and that's not gonna change your overall riskiness of overall your tax revenues very much. You don't need to lever if you want your balance sheet a lot to be able to do that. So, 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 the, so the US ends up doing more. Well, in, in contrast, an emerging market with relatively low ETAG to get the same type of impact, same Lambda, same impact on financial markets, you need to take a lot more risk relative to your tax capacity and that could be quite distortionary. So, so you do that, you still, you can still do it, but you do, you do less of it, okay? So, and we also find that all, uh, uh, the higher initial leverage of your risk tolerant agents or a worse recession, low Z, also induce you to do more. And that's exactly, that's directly related to the steepness of the red line that I've been talking about, because these things make this red line steeper. And because they make the red line steeper, they may increase the marginal impact of the policy and you end up doing more, right? You don't do more just because things are bad. You're doing more because precisely because your marginal impact on outcomes here, they can be quite large. And so, 
And uh, in a final extension of the paper, uh, we also uh, analyzed corporate debt overhang uh, problems. So these are uh, a major concern, corporate that has been increasing even before the, uh, uh, before the COVID shock. And, and now with the COVID shock is, is, a, is a, a huge concern, right? So there's many companies are, especially small and mid-sized companies face risk of bankruptcy because they cannot meet uh, liabilities. So we put that into the model. So remember there was this capital and, um, uh, and, and market portfolio was a claim on capital. Now we have this continuum of firms that actually uh, each one ma manages a unit of capital and they start with initial positions. So, some, so B here is the initial liability of the, of the firm. So, and it can also be negative. When it's negative, it means that firm starts with some cash. Maybe those are the large firms that have accumulated cash in the past. But when it's uh, positive, that means the firm has some liabilities accumulated from the past that it needs to meet. And these things uh, across the firm sum to zero, right? And the market uh, portfolio is now a claim on the portfolio of these firms. Um, so why does this uh, matter? Now? Because now you, you face a solvency, potentially your firms face a solvency problem, right? So actually, if you add financial fictions, that would make insolvency even more likely. But even without financial frictions, you face a solvency uh, problem here because you still need to meet your liability. And how do you meet it? You meet it with your earnings, which is the current output, but also uh, you can use your, 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 your capital as collateral and, and to raise uh, some money against that. And even without uh, constraints, this is the amount of money that you'll be able to raise, right? So this says that the firm will be insolvent when its current earnings, as well as the money it can raise through using its capital as collateral, is not enough to meet its obligations. Those are the insolvent firms. And, and the key insight here is that naturally find that asset prices now make more firms solvent. Right? So higher asset prices um, make more, so, more firms solvent or reduce the number of insolvencies. And, and actually there are two channels here. Well, the first is just, uh, you know, it makes the firm's collateral becomes more valuable. You can, you can borrow more. So if you think of like a, a Q as a price of bonds, in fact, it's quite natural. If the bond prices are higher, spreads are lower for any given amount of future payoff, you'll be able to raise more money. So that make that helps to uh, uh, with solvency. But there's a second effect as well because asset prices affect through demand, economic activity and output. When you support asset prices, you support firms earnings. And again, that helps them uh, to stay afloat. Okay, so, and importantly, we also assume insolvent firms become uh, somewhat unproductive, right? And we think that's quite natural, especially for small and medium-sized firms that might not find it feasible, or might find costly to go to bankruptcy court. But even if you're able to do the bankruptcy, declare bankruptcy and restructure your firm, that's not gonna be perfect. So your productivity, once you become insolvent, will fall somewhat. And if you have that, now you see, uh, this just makes the amplification that I described even stronger, right? So the output asset price relation becomes now even more powerful because low asset prices affect output, not only through low demand, but also they endogenously lower the supply, right? They put more firms into bankruptcy and they become less productive. So basically you get the strength, the strength of that relation becomes even more powerful. More importantly for our purposes, for our mechanism, the risk tolerance and asset price relation becomes more powerful as well, right? So even earlier without these effects, you had the low prices uh, uh, harm the banks and put them into some distress that lower risk tolerance. Now you have that effect become even bigger because uh, risk tolerant agents are investing in all the firms. If fraction of the firms go bankrupt, their investments now will fall, not just because each firm is valued less, but now there's less firms are up, right? So, so it's as if the shock to the, the distress of the banks um, are, uh, is bigger. So in terms of our picture, this is how uh, it affects the analysis. So the dashed line here is the case without the debt overhang problem. And uh, that's what I showed you earlier. The solid line is what happens to the risk tolerance, uh, sort of required uh, sharp ratio, the left side of the equation, when you have um, uh, also solvency problems, that, that overhang. And you see it shifts out because uh, now with more firms are distressed and all our SQL lower prices and higher, uh, lower tolerance and higher required risk premium, but, but also it becomes steeper, right? Because additional declines in asset prices now are more damaging because they also wipe out firms and they put even more distress on banks and raise the required sharp ratio. So, so once you make it steeper, you see 
And remember, the steepness of the curve was very central for the, for, for, the, for the power of our mechanisms. Everything that I said earlier, once you had corporate debt overhead, becomes stronger. And, and, and likewise, um, central bank asset purchases become much more powerful. Wealth stocks become much more powerful as well because they will shift the, the red line down. And as you see now, they're going to be more powerful because not only you're going to improve demand, but you're going to also ensure more firms uh, survive, right? And an intuition for that is very straightforward. You improve asset prices, you improve bond prices, you reduce spreads, more firms will survive. They will be able to do bridge financing perhaps and, and to, weather, to weather the shock. So, okay, and the right side here shows you what happens in terms of the fraction of solvent firms. You start initially a situation, you set things up so that um, all firms will be solvent. And in fact, if there was no debt overhang, that's always, the there's no solvency problem. Firms are always solvent. But once you have that overhang problem, a shock now uh, makes a, a sort of a, here in this numerical example, 6% of the firms become insolvent. And then you see the, the direct impact of the shock, the reduction in supply already makes firms insolvent, right? So even if you don't have a demand problem, just because your productivity falls, capacity falls, you produce less, some firms will go under, but the demand problem and low asset prices will make a lot more firms uh, go under. Okay. So um, let me uh, conclude. Uh, I think I'm going to finish maybe five minutes early so we can have some discussion. So motivated by the financial market fallout that we have seen in March um, and driven by the COVID shock, we build a model in which a real shock, a non-financial shock um, can uh, lower asset prices and create amplification in financial markets, which then has runs the danger of coming back to and, and lowering economic activity. And the key ingredient is uh, having heterogeneous uh, risk tolerance in financial markets. So when you have that, when you get a, a recessionary shock like COVID, that makes the that that makes the, the representative investor that prices assets essentially less risk tolerant, and and that tends to that puts downward pressure on asset prices and aggregate demand. An interest rate cut is the most natural response to this because it diffuses this downward pressure. But if you cannot cut interest rate a lot, then enough, then in fact, you will have a decline in asset prices and, uh, and an ugly spiral and adding corporate debt overhang uh, elements uh, and amplify the spiral. And in this environment, unconventional policies can be quite powerful because they take the risk that the market is struggling to hold away from uh, the market, absorb it. And, uh, and, and by doing that, they raise asset prices and with it aggregate demand. Actually, let me hear come back to the original uh, absorption boxes that I showed you earlier. Um, so one way of thinking about what LSAPs are doing here is like government absorbing the risk, right? So we are used to thinking that if there's a demand problem in the top boxes in the goods market, having government spending is good. We, are used to sort of, we, 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 we have learned that over time. So, so there is a similar issue in risk markets, right? If there's a supply of risk and you're unable to absorb that, you want basically the government to come in and absorb it, right? So this LSAPs are really the G equivalent of the government spending in goods market, or that's, that's the way we would like to think about that. And, and by doing that, you're not doing that just to stabilize asset prices, you also stabilize uh, economic activity. And once you have this kind of mapping of the government is coming and absorbing risk, and it's like G, you actually naturally start thinking about other policies that have analogs in goods market as well, right? So. So one thing, for instance, in the goods market, when a shock like this hits, what do you want to do? You want to relax the constraints on your households or firms so they can spend, right? So maybe you are doing some leverage restrictions in good times, but now it's not the time for leverage. You let, you want, you're trying to get them to spend. Same thing in risk markets. Maybe you put some restrictions on banks for macro prudential purposes in good times. In fact, we have some papers where we show that's actually a good idea in good times. But when you get a shock like this, you want to relax those restrictions. So not only you spend, but you also help your agents stand risk and absorb the risk. Okay? And likewise, just like in the goods market, a um, precautionary scenario or a tail risk can really make people not spend, or firms not spend, there's a financial market, risk market analog of that as well. It could be that a tail risk is the reason why your institutions are not investing in risky assets because they really worry about these very bad outcomes that will wipe them out. Maybe they're not worried about the plain vanilla, but they worry about the COVID risk going on two, three years. In that case, in fact, if you, instead of buying assets, but if you offer insurance with respect to that tail risk, if you tell them, look, I got you covered. If things go so bad, I will in fact 
uh, in true asset prices. That might be, by the way, enough that instead of buying assets, these put type of policies um, might already help quite a bit to stimulate spending in the risk market, right? So, okay, with that, um, let me stop and, and take any questions uh, that you might have. All right. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Let's see. Thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. Very clear. Um, so right now we're going to move to the question and answer. And for those of you um, that have a question, and I definitely encourage people to ask questions. And even if you want to follow up on some, some questions that came up in the Q&A that were answered, just so um, Shimsek has a chance to reply also. So, so please raise your hands and I will uh, unmute you and call on you if you do so. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get us started. All right, I don't know my camera works now. Um, so one thing first, I just wanted to congratulate the two of you for being super timely because uh, Yellen was just on a Brookings conference and called for a new Dodd-Frank and was very concerned about the risk that built up in the non-bank sector and particularly in particular hedge funds. So you all brought a model to think through that. Um, I guess one, one thing that would be helpful and you talked about this channel the supply and the demand shock and through financial markets, which I completely agree with. We had both happening. Can you talk about, there was so much that happened in March in terms of stabilizing financial markets in the United States and across the globe. And then uh, we've seen actually a really big rebound. I think that's probably surprised some people. And there's a lot of discussion about how, because the Fed did so many things to backstop so many financial markets, that it really had an amplification in a way that we didn't see in uh, after the 2008 financial crisis. So if there's anything you can say about like policies that you saw that really like plugged into your framework and you're like, oh, that's, that's what really kicked it on like in a positive way or anything you've seen that like, you're like in the way that I think about this, that was the wrong thing to do. Uh, Ricardo, do you want to take that? You want to jump in? Sure, I can. I can give you some time so you can you, you think. <laughs> uh, uh, interestingly, actually, uh, you know, most of the effect on on the market uh, happened before the Fed did act, did anything. <laughs> you know, this was very equivalent to the Mario Draghi whatever it takes speech. Uh, the corporate bond, for example, uh, to, today the the, the 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 Fed became the third largest holder of LQD, which is the main ETF now for investment grade bonds. But it, they, it just started purchasing. However, if you look at the path of the price of that instrument, it, it and you know declined by thirty percent and it came up by twenty five percent just after the announcement. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that operates directly through the risk balance condition in our mode, and 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 uh, I think the mapping is is, is very direct. Uh, there are also credit policies, and those operate as in the last slides that, that I'll uh, mention, but, but I think that those will take some time. I think for us, the most direct uh, effect, and the reason it was so su successful is, is because it compressed the required sharp ratio very, very dramatically. Now, here Alp and I disagree a little bit. I, I, I don't believe, for example, that at this moment, uh, US equity markets are overvalued absent another collapse, you know, another big wave or something like that. And the way I do this, this, this I think about this is sort of a very basic back of the envelope calculation. I, I, I said, look, you know, yeah, initially output declined by 30%, but we don't, we know that we can restart the economy to some, some extent. So assume that this stuff has a lasting effect five years or so, on average of 15%, so you need a decline in output of 15%. Well, you know, if, if workers absorb part of that and so on, so you know a little bit leverage and so on, implicit leverage as well, that should lead to a decline in asset, in asset prices of 15% on average. Now that's, but we also know there's a lot of heterogeneity, you know, there are some firms that are not affected at all by the COVID shock. So this zero shock really wasn't negative. In fact, for some of them it's even positive. Amazon and places like that. 
And of course, there are other uh, firms in, for which the G0 is very concentrated on them, airlines, cruises, uh, you know, stuff like that. So you get on average 15%, but you get a lot of heterogeneity. Now, if you look at the markets, uh, it turns out that in the US, the NASDAQ index, for example, is very loaded towards those companies that weren't really affected by the ZZ or shock. Okay, so I don't find it surprising that NASDAQ is already higher than it used to be because they got all the policy support that the median company needed for companies that were not really affected directly by the shock. If you look at the SPX index, well, that solid, it still is very biased towards technology companies and so on, and it leaves away all the capital of restaurants and stuff like that. You move to Russell, which has lots of smaller companies, well, it's more depressed than the average. So I think if you look at the relative, uh, relative asset prices and even the average level, it looks reasonable now, given what the Fed has done. Uh, in, in, uh, initially, everything declined by a big amount because you had a second factor, which was not only the expected decline in earnings, but you also had this big risk premium component. And that's exactly what the Fed removed. Once you remove it and you look at the cross-section of asset prices, it doesn't look that distorted to me. Uh, I think that was a great answer. So I want to add uh, three quick things. Uh, first uh, is, uh, as Ricardo said, financial markets are very forward-looking. So the announcement of the policies themselves, even without the actual purchases, is naturally gets priced. And I think that's a lot of what we have seen in March in terms of which announcements were more important. Um, so actually, even before the announcement, there was a, a earlier stages, there was that the Fed increased their purchases of treasuries. So that's actually because given that treasuries are safe, you might think that's a little puzzle, but puzzling from our perspective. But what happened is uh, at the time, there was a disruption in financial uh, intermediation, sort of financial frictions that are not in our model and liquidity issues that actually, even treasuries, the sort of the safest, safest asset fell. And some of the interventions dealt directly with that. But beyond that, the other interventions, I think, sort of the announcements that matter were things like credit market supporting facilities, for instance, the primary market and secondary market credit facilities, but also the fact that this signal by the government very strong intervention if, if, if need be. So I think the treasury backstop, which the Fed had the, uh, could use, uh, was actually very important because it, just, it comes down the markets. The final thing I want to add to Ricardo's answer is that well, we disagree on whether markets are over, a little overvalued or not. And, um, but uh, even if they're overvalued, actually, that's not a bad thing for the economy. So if you think there's a bubble in markets now, that's a very lucky thing. You know, it's exactly when you want to have the bubble in the recession. Right? I don't, I mean, we disagree. And maybe Ricardo is right. There's not, in fact, not so much of a bubble once you account for low interest rates and policy support. But if there was one, that would be a good thing, right? So, you know, we're not we're in a, live in a retribution world where you want banks to suffer because when... Uh, Financial markets are high, it will affect aggregate demand. These things might not be immediate, but a growing set of empirical evidence shows that eventually you see a reaction in spending, uh, spending as well. So it's a good thing if you have a bubble. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I just like a higher marginal propensity to consume out all those people that have the uh, stocks going up. But no, I think that's no, no, yeah, but really, oh, go ahead. Sorry. That's a good point. Let me, let me, let me. So, so we show, I think, somewhere in the paper that suppose that you, 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 you split the population between hand-to-mouth hand people that have no portfolio whatsoever, and then a share of people that, that have this stuff. You can solve and you get exactly the same equations because of the aggregate demand effect. Now, you, you, you see, so, so you, you need to move very little these guys, and then you have lots of hand-to-mouth hand people that gives you a very powerful change in multiplier. So, so you, you change the share, you increase the multiplier, and you get sort of the same sort of effect. Now, I'm with you that at some point, we're going to create a revolution if we just use this channel, no? because uh, it's going to cause a revolution. So you may want to use other aggregate demand policies as well to act more directly if you're going to be sort of, if everything's going to be depending on this. But absent all those other things, this is doing the job in terms of supporting aggregate demand. And so, it's not a function of how important they are. Whatever we are right, that, that I think we will hit other constraints if we just use this lever. <laughs> so you need mm -hmm. to use other levers as well. Yeah, no, and up to this point, we've seen the fiscal authorities acting yeah. too. It's a question of how much more they will. Okay, so that was really helpful. Thank you both. All right, I still don't see any hands raised in the participants. I know you all have great questions. So 
get some hands up. Um, okay, but I, so I'm gonna turn a couple of the organizers, we have questions, so to give you time to get your hands up. All right, so first I'm gonna go to Morton, if you wanna ask your question. Yeah, so that was a great presentation, yeah, and I think it, um, it's uh, quite intuitive what you're finding. Um, one thing I was wondering a little bit is that, like, um, so it seems here, like, when you do the asset purchases, it's kind of great because then if you're buying up this risky stuff, but then the asset price also uh, recovers, so it's kind, of, it's kind of a good deal. But is there a point at which, like, yeah, so suppose you get, like, a really, like, a last decline in the, in the in, t in tax revenue at the same time, but it sort of can go the other way. Now you bought up this risky thing, and then like the whole government becomes more risky, and you you go in, and you start start spiraling to a really bad equilibrium instead, because now you you can sort of get a reinforcing effect that goes the other way. Uh, so that's a great that's a great question. So um, so you're you're right. The government here is investing in risky assets when their price is low. Um, so they're actually, the government is actually earning a risk premium. So an expectation is an expectation you could in fact make money and can make quite a lot of money given that the risk tolerance is so low. But, but, but that said, there is a tail risk. And in fact, that's the whole point, right? I think uh, uh, yeah, that there's no free lunch. So the point is that you're going to benefit on average, your tax uh, bills will go down, but there are states where your tax bills um, will go up or your tax revenues will decline. So um, so that's um, uh, this is why you need sort of some fiscal capacity. That's in fact one way of thinking about why a government with bigger fiscal capacity is doing more of this. Now, if you think about governments with small fiscal capacity, like maybe some emerging market governments, they in fact uh, can also worry about if your tax revenues decline a lot and now you get into an ugly spiral, sort of a doom loop between government finances and economic activity. The worry of that, private markets worry of that can in fact constrain you quite a bit. And, and that's part of the reason why in fact, such emerging markets might not be able to do as much as. However, that having said that, there are some empirical studies that uh, actually the emerging market central banks also have done similar asset purchase like policies, similar policies, in fact, invested in risky assets and credit markets. They, they tend to have smaller uh, markets, but they did invest in, 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 in credit. And, and there are studies uh, by BIS, there's a study by BIS authors, Matthias Drehman and co-authors, and they find that actually these policies have been quite powerful, also in emerging market governments, where you would worry about the issues that you described the most, right? So what they find is that you ended up a similar seeing a similar decline in spreads. And, and in fact, and you also don't see an effect on the exchange rate, because if there is a place where these uh, sort of the cost to damaging aspects of this potential which you have is the exchange rate, right? Because essentially international investors might um, get nervous and might, might, might pull out and that might de depreciate their currencies, but they don't find that. They find the beneficial effects on asset prices and yields. And that said, of course, it doesn't mean that you do a lot as an emerging market central bank. You need to tread a lot more carefully. But I think for a country like the US, I personally, if I have people disagree on this, I don't worry about the US getting anytime soon into, into a doom loop, right? So, for a for a company. So. No, I, I I mean I I I know the case of Chile relatively well, and, and indeed, as Alp said, that, you know they do everything. They do more or less the same on a smaller scale. But let me say that that I think that that one of the reasons emerging markets have done reasonably well, it's not so much for the domestic QE. But it's because the US QE has really floated everything. <laughs> and if you look at what happens to the currencies, the currencies in mission emerging markets were depreciating very, very rapidly before uh, the Fed intervened. As soon as the Fed intervened, that was one of the risky assets actually that turned around. So that's a good thing for this global equilibrium at this moment, which is that, that if you're a small emerging market and you have to do a, a, a QE to deal with your own shock, then probably your effects is going to suffer a lot. But, but if you're part of this big umbrella of the US, uh, then, then, then we're a little bit more protected. If some of those EM lag behind and the US moves on, <laughs> that's going to be a problem. But, but at this moment, it's, it's very synchronized and that's working well. And I, Now, formally, in terms of our model, I think you're absolutely right. You could imagine, as, as Al described, you know, uh, there is a fiscal risk. So you could imagine you go to the next period and you've got a bad realization of the fiscal risk and now your fiscal capacity is a little smaller. Then obviously, 
even the optimal policy will say, well, we're going to do a little bit less of the policy because now you have less fiscal capacity. And you could imagine a spiral in which eventually you lose all the capacity to deal with stuff and then you're left with a raw shock. Mm -hmm. I'm very good at All right. Okay. Thank you. Just, let me check the. Still don't see anything. All right. No raised hands in the audience. Really, please ask a question. All right. So, because uh, these answers are really great. So, you guys are doing a fantastic job. All right. So, I will turn. Uh, Ralph had a question to ask as well. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the great presentation, Al. So, I was just wondering because uh, you were inviting the comparison. You said we should think about, you know, this asset price effects of, of, of government policy, like the typical demand management that we see when it goes about the goods market. So can I also think about some kind of multiplier here? So what are kind of the real resources that the government, you know, you know, puts into the economy and what do I get in terms of output? So do we have like an idea of whether the multipliers here are a larger one? A smaller one, they depend on the, you know, we talked a little bit about this, about NPCs. So we have a very good understanding for the goods market that it might depend on NPCs to, you know, on the changing cost, whether you get amplification and get a multiplier larger one. So do you have like a similar analysis for this intervention in financial markets? That's a, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, yeah. Ricardo, do you have something? I can't say something. No, I mean, I, I, it is going to be the, the product of two multipliers. And you're, I mean, it, we should calculate that stuff because it, in the goods market, you have the same multiplier, no? But you, what you have to see is what is the impact of the intervention, the policy intervention on the asset price, which is what feeds into the aggregate demand law. So we need an estimate of that, that second multiplier, which is the impact of the asset purchase on or the interest rate on uh, uh, the asset price. So, so I agree with that. And I think the first multiplier, you want to think kind of in the risk space. So for a given amount of risk uh, uh, that you're absorbing from the market, and, you know, because different assets are not comparable to do an apples to apples. So you kind of do it as a, as in our model, Sigma, what you could think about a, a practical counterpart to that as well. Uh, how much uh, impact you're having on asset prices. So that's the first thing. And in our model, this, is, this multiplier is going to be quite strong. The second thing is that once you have this impact, how much you, you influence uh, spending? And that's going back to the discussion with Claudia. Let me actually say one thing, uh, add to uh, Ricardo's answer to that. Once you add investment into the mix, actually, that could be uh, uh, quite more powerful. So if you're leaning on the wealthy guys to spend, that, that effect can be a little small. But although it gets, uh, as Ricardo said, amplified then by the hand-to-mouth guys. But once you add investment, that could be quite big, right? Especially if there are, you're in a situation where some firms are constrained like this, like that current situation, then you can get a quite powerful amplification in the goods market too, because when you raise asset price and lower interest rate spreads, you're gonna raise investment. You're gonna prevent a fall in investment. So, but that's the kind of thing that you wanna measure. So how much asset prices affect spending? We have actually NPCs uh, for that. And, but also how much asset prices affect investment and how much they in total affect aggregate demand. That's, you know, I, I think we are in early stages in measuring these things, but they seem measurable uh, to me. Okay, sounds interesting. Let, let me also uh, add a little bit of uh, advertisement to a new paper we're writing with, with Al, which is that we know that asset prices affect aggregate demand as I've said with a, with a lag, you know? So one big issue here uh, from this recession is that I mean, what is going to be the state of the economy once we can sort of reopen it? No, we, we have aggregate demand there already and, and so on and so forth. But as long as you, if you know that, that asset prices affect aggregate demand with, with lags, which you know they do, they do uh, then there's even more of a reason to start inflating asset prices today. No? So because you want to be, have the economy ready, aggregate demand ready for the time in which you can really start opening restaurants in a mass and so on. So, 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 so the it's idea is today, what I'm trying to say, you would see sort of big, a big a, a, a gap between Main Street and Wall Street today, and you wouldn't see much of an effect on aggregate demand, but you still may want to do it just to prepare the economy for the time in which can, can be open. You're sort of trying to hit the gaps in the future and having high prices now is good because that's your policy lever, lever now, and that will help you to have more spending and smaller gaps in the future. So, 
So uh, but going back to your question, yeah, these are the things that you want to measure. And ideally, you want to know also the lags of these effects and so on. I think there's a lot of empirical work to do. There's a lot of emphasis on MPC out of income, but uh, you know, MPC out of stock, well, there's some MPC out of housing wealth and huge literature on MPC out of stock wealth. And um, you know, we should look at uh, investment out of wealth and so on as well. Okay, great. All right, so we have a question from the audience. So Yan Xiao, let me see if I can un ah, crap. I need to unmute you. Uh, sorry. Do you see um, Rao from, oh, there we go. Come on. Hello. Sorry. Oh, there you go. All right. Thank you. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, thanks, Corrida. Uh, thanks, Anne and uh, Ricardo, for the uh, interesting paper. I like it, and the presentation make it even clearer. So my question is related to Claudia's uh, question on the disconnect between the stock market and the real economy, right? So uh, I guess Ricardo addressed some uh, some of this issue, but uh, imagine the stock market recover, and uh, and that would improve the uh, the wealth of the uh, risk tolerant tolerant Asian, uh, um, as well, right? So basically, uh, that even if it's unrelated uh, to the shock, but the fact that the asset price recovers, that improves the wealth of these risk tolerant uh, agents. So we we will see like you know the improve in in economic activity because of the mechanism. So is that very puzzling that uh, that there's a recover uh, the asset price recover, but economic activity remain depressed? Okay, so that's a great hi Dan. Uh. That's a great question. It directly relates to what, what the, the earlier discussion. So uh, we think uh, the and, and this is actually confirmed with empirical estimates as well. Aggregate demand and spending reacts to asset prices, but they also react with a lag. And in fact, any reasonable economic model you're going to write down will, will get this as well, right? I mean, people are not going to just change their if there's a wealth, even if there's a wealth effect, they're not just going to adjust their spending all the time as long as you put some delays and recognition and wealth or reacting you're gonna get these delays. In fact, I have a recent empirical paper where we find a stock wealth effects of three cents on the dollar for a year, but we also find that the effect peaks at a two year horizon, right? So, so once you add these lags, one way of interpreting the current situation is that, well, asset prices recovered, but they're predicting and they're also causing economic activity, but the causal things are delayed. Okay, so, and, and also, uh, so that's our, it's our interpretation. And in a, the other paper that Ricardo was advertising, we actually make these lags explicit. And this is exactly what you find. The optimal path looks like there's a negative output gap, but a positive asset price gap, because essentially you're trying to um, stimulate the spending for the, for the time when your supply will recover and you're gonna have enough spending that you won't have gaps in the future. So, so do you think it's okay. lags? Add to that a little. Uh, uh, um, Remember that, that uh, uh, in most places, in the US less than in other places, in NASDAQ even less, but asset prices are lower than, than they were before. They are just lowered by 15%, not by 40%, which is what could have happened had the Fed not intervened there. Okay, so, so asset prices have recovered. Uh, again, if you were to measure asset prices of restaurants and so on, they haven't recovered as much so on average. Uh, uh, no aggregate demand wealth has declined by 15 percent or so and that's more or less what output has declined so so i, I don't right. but I, uh ricardo in the in the balance sheet effects right the, the aggregate market is what matter right not the, the subset of the mass financial market right because the wealth effect comes through the the aggregate stock market no no but it's not only stock market it's all capital oh okay so the private equity and and yeah, houses, houses, yeah. Okay, sure, thanks. Yeah, so the lack is- But even in the stock markets, again, if you look at the Russell, the Russell is still must be down, I don't know, eight, nine percent. So, which is a broader sense of, of things. That's also why they were related yeah. to Claudia's point that uh, it's something we don't address in this paper, but it's something that we, we are thinking about, which is that not all agents hold the same assets. And it's very likely, especially the banks, are not going to be holding lots of equity. They are being holding sort of, you know, much more fixed income, upper tranches of CDOs, stuff like that. 
And in that sense, the policy supporting those trade spreads was extremely important and effective. Okay, so, so, so it's much more on the stock market. In fact, the typical sort of lever up agent is not a very equity kind of guy, maybe holding ball or something like that, or short ball, but, but, but it's not going to be sort of a straight equity because that doesn't allow you to lever up a lot, <laughs> among other things. So let me add to that. Actually, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great answer. So if you, if you, I mean, there's a lot of focus on the stock market, but here really you have the market portfolio and the private firms and small firms are still struggling quite a lot. And if you measure their, if you were able to measure their prices, I think I find that they're low. But the other thing that this perspective brings is you might want to tilt your policy a little bit toward more of these struggling firms. If you don't do that, so you just invest in the market portfolio, so invest in everything in proportion. But if you actually allow that margin, especially for the corporate overhead problem, uh, you would want to tilt a bit toward the more distressed companies because you get more bang out of pot uh, from, from doing those interventions. And that we think is kind of reflected in the type of things that the Fed is trying to do uh, recently as well. Okay. And the implication of that is that the bank equity, right? If we look at the financial index related to bank financial sector, maybe that is a good indicator of, uh, of the risk like returns uh, agents uh, wealth or something, right? Yeah, that's a very good yeah. point. By the way, it's, it's a very good point for two reasons. It's, it's um, the financial sector is affected by this mechanism, but also directly because eventually it sort of, you know, it absorbs all the credit the losses and so on. And you can see that that's a sector that is still very distressed. Right. Less so in the yes. US and Europe, but it is quite distressed. Right, okay. Thanks, Anne and Ricardo, that's very clear. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we have probably time for one more question, and I don't see anybody else from the floor. So I'm going to kick it back. Morton had one more uh, follow-up question for you all. Uh, I am just going to take advantage of having you guys here. Um, so that I find that your answers have been uh, really fantastic. So I was just wondering about, do you have a story about what went on early on when asset prices declined, but at the same time also, like the the bond markets were extremely liquid. I mean, that was, yeah, the, I mean, there was a huge problem for everybody trying to rebalance their portfolios at that yeah, point. So I, 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 Ricardo, do you want to take that? Uh, well, I, I'll say something. I, I, by the way, the, the illiquidity problem began way before the, that event. I mean, if you look at the, what was happening with Treasury uh, with us and, and, and actually even in equity futures, indices, Emini uh, and so on. There was, there was sort of lots of illiquidity before that event. Now, in mid-March, that was very extreme because it hit the treasury market. Yeah. And uh, we're still trying to understand exactly what happened, but we know that there are at least two things that, that were quite important. Uh, one is foreigners. I mean, contrary to what people think, in this, in this instance, unlike the global financial crisis, foreigners run away from treasury. So you can see a big outflows of treasury, much larger than the typical flows in that market. And then apparently there was another sort of a, a, a carry traded strategy that was sort of been done in big size mm. in, in the hedge fund world that, that got unwound there. There were margin calls and so on. And so they had to dump the, the, the treasury. So it was a massive run for cash to cover margin calls, to cover, it co cover sort of different needs of emerging market in particular. And, uh, and also actually financial, the financial sector in developed economies. Well, those were sort of big sellers of, of, of US treasuries. Um, and, and if you think about, for example, the repo facility that, that the, 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 Fed, the Fed implemented several repo facilities, but one of the, the repo facilities they, they, they implemented was with, with all the, the uh, central banks around the world that do not have access, direct access to the swap lines. So first they expanded the swap lines but that wasn't enough because still there were sort of foreign central banks selling US treasuries and that was sort of destabilizing the US treasury market. So they opened a repo facility so they could pledge their treasuries in exchange for US dollar cash. Okay? And I always tell my friends in emerging markets that that was not a generous action by the Fed towards emerging market. It was an action taken mostly to stabilize the US treasury market. So uh, related, I, 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 that's a great, uh, so I, a great answer. I can add one thing to that. So um, the, while they were selling these US assets and treasuries, uh, as well as other things, the US markets were unable to absorb that, part because they were struggling themselves, so that there was the capacity, but also because 
the capital required, like banks are more constrained now and these constraints play a good role in, in good times. They're put for a, for a good reason in the aftermath of the financial crisis. But I think we should think about making these banks constraints counter cyclical. So very quickly you can relax them and maybe bring your banking sector. Actually the Fed did that, exactly that. The Fed did relax the, the capital charges on US treasuries precisely to, to, to relax that capacity, which was a question asked Somewhere a good question asked as in the in the Q and A. Uh, uh, I mean, in, whether, whether it will be useful to to have this counter cyclical sort of regulations on capital charges, and indeed, I think it is very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, with the caveat of the previous question you asked, which is, well, works very well if you can stop it here. If it keeps going, then then eventually, but then you have to choose where to intervene and and. Okay. All right. Well, I don't see any more hands up and I think we've got the questions covered. So I, I want to thank you, Ricardo and Alp. That was, that was a really great talk. You all did a great job setting up very clearly what your paper and your findings and the answers were really, really interesting. So I appreciate that to both of you and thank you to everybody who has joined in on the virtual macro seminar series. It's really exciting. We're finishing the first phase. And again, I want to encourage everyone to sign up and attend the junior series that is starting next week. It's going to, it's going to be really great. So we're it's actually starting continuing. this week, Claudia. Oh, sorry. This week. Oh, I'm day. sorry. It's July already. I'm in denial. Okay. Yes, because yes, today is last day of June oh, no. in the second quarter. <laughs> and so um, thank you. Apologize for the mistake. So join everyone on Thursday to kick off the new series and we'll keep the research going. And again, thank you, Ricardo and Alp. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claudia. Claudia and, uh, thanks also, especially for saying my last name correctly. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I was very <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks. Bye everyone.